There's a new preprint out now that you got to know about. It's entitled The Risk of Myopericarditis Following COVID-19 MRNA Vaccination in a Large Integrated Health System, Comparison of Completeness and Timeliness of Two Methods. The lead author is Dr. Katie Sheriff who is a graduate of the University of Chicago Medical School. She was just a couple years ahead of me. She is an infectious disease doctor, and she practices at Northwest Kaiser Permanente, which is Kaiser Permanente Portland. And this is a brilliant analysis that takes advantage of the data set used by Kaiser Permanente, which is a very robust data set that follows all of the people that Kaiser provides health insurance for and medical care for over time. And here's what Katie Sheriff and colleagues do in this very remarkable preprint. What they do is they ask, if you were to look at the estimate of myocarditis and pericarditis that has appeared from the Israelis, you'll find something in the ballpark of one one in 3,000 to one in 5,000. And if you look at the estimate that is repeatedly presented to the advisory committee of the US FDA, the VERBAC, or even at the CDC's HIP, you will find an estimate that's a little bit less frequent than that. And there's a huge debate online. You can go online and see people arguing tooth and nail about what the precise estimate is. I have always felt that the Israelis since their estimate is in line with the Norwegians, is in line with other nations that have robust healthcare systems, including Hong Kong, that that estimate is very likely to be true. Katie Sheriff proves that in a U.S.-based healthcare system. That's what she does in this paper. So here's what they do. In contrast with the method used by the CDC to ascertain rates of myopericarditis, they just use ICD-10 codes, and they use a certain set of codes. Katie Sheriff goes beyond that. She uses both those codes, but also she searches the free text of all hospital notes. She's searching the free text for myocarditis and pericarditis and pulling those notes out where they may not have been coded with a certain billing code, but they may have had that language in the documentation themselves. And by doing so, she's able to find additional cases. There's one more thing she finds. She finds that there's a billing code, an ICD-10 billing code of myocarditis unspecified that the CDC method does not use, but her method has found, and that is linked to real cases of vaccine-induced myocarditis. All the cases are reviewed by experts, and they're confirmed to be confirmed or probable myocarditis due to vaccination. So her strength is that she's using a search of the electronic medical record that goes beyond the ICD-10 codes. But there's one more thing she does. She also looks to see what had somebody got the vaccine within the Kaiser Permanente system, and then this kid happened to go home, and they had chest pain in the middle of the night. They were rushed to the local hospital. They're not in the Kaiser Permanente system. And that hospital took care of them for myocarditis or pericarditis, and then later that hospital submitted a billing claim to Kaiser Permanente. And she's able to pull those out and find that there are additional cases she can identify through that method. And those bills submitted to Kaiser often come at a delay. Some even come more than 30 days after the hospitalization. So what does this have to do with the CDC method? She is showing you two ways in which the CDC's method likely underestimates the risk of myopericarditis. One, they're missing an ICD code. Two, some encounters use this language in the notes that don't have relevant ICD codes. And three, some people were hospitalized outside of surveillance center sites, and those bills are still being processed even 30 days after vaccination. And so there may be an increase from all these three sources together. And the net result is her estimate is remarkably consistent with other nations' estimates for men between the ages of 12 12 and 17, after dose two, she finds an incidence of 377 per million, which is roughly one in 2,700. For men between the ages of 18 and 24, myopericarditis is roughly one in 1,900. Much more frequent than what the CDC is using to make their decisions and what Verbeck is using to make their decisions. And that's the insight of her paper. Risk of myopericarditis following COVID-19 mRNA vaccination, large integrated health system. It shows the deficiencies, I think, in our current passive surveillance system, relying too heavily on ICD-10 codes and not using that free text language. She's able to bridge all of this in a very elegant paper. This has direct implications for everything we're talking about these days. It has implications for mandates around going to school, what we're going to do with young boys, the booster decision that we're poised to make next week. Again, in the absence of a verback, I hope they have an A-chip on this. I hope they have some advisory committee to this. This is important information for all these groups. It also harmonizes the despair, the disparate um, estimates. You know, we have seen that some countries have reported higher estimates. Ontario province, Norway, Israel was higher than the U.S. estimate. People think that these estimates are somehow different. I'll tell you what, they're probably not that different. People are people. We're the same flesh and blood over there on this. We are over here. It's probably very similar. What it really tells you is which nations have good, robust surveillance systems and which have surveillance systems that have holes or flaws or limits or could be improved upon. And that's our system. So I like Hong Kong. I like Ontario. And I like this paper. I think it's probably closer to the truth. 
And I also think that preprints that came along the way that had estimates in this ballpark that were disparaged online were unfairly disparaged. And I feel bad for those authors. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, hit that bell below. Until next time.